Welcome back to another episode of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. So today we're gonna to talk about something a little theoretical. We're gonna talk about the relationship between architecture and ambiguity. What do you do when the specs aren't entirely clear or the plans aren't entirely clear, what people need aren't entirely clear? We're gonna discuss that with our architects and I hope you're gonna join us. Um, and when you're done doing that, I recommend checking out the links below and subscribing. Okay, let's get right to it and talk to our architects. Hey, well, welcome back to Armchair Architects, and it's delightful to see Eric and Uli again. Um, this time, I'd like to talk about something like this. Nebulous. I would like to talk, what? Nebulous. Nebulous, yeah. Well, hey, great way to put it. Um, what I was hoping we would talk about is the relationship between architecture and ambiguity. Um, because I get the sense that it's not uncommon for people to come at architects with very vague statements or questions that aren't, that aren't really precise or a problem that needs to be solved, but it's not really clear what that problem is. And I just want to talk a little bit about like what can architects uh, help? What can they do around, around ambiguity? Because I think that, um, I think Eric, you had told me that like people have this urge to like fill in the gap, like architects will rush in to fill in gaps. What, what do you think goes on when somebody comes at you and, and asks you a vague question like I just did? <laughs> well, I think, I think depending on your, the depth uh, of your experience, you have to get more comfortable with ambiguity. Uh, I think as okay. as answer people, and maybe there are more there are lots of answer people in the software industry. Our goal is to excise ambiguity. It makes us uncomfortable, and the best thing that we can do to excise ambiguity is to make an assumption and then answer that assumption. Sometimes all within the same breath, and that's where I think the term false precision really arises, which is you give a very precise answer to a question that you think will excise the ambiguity based on the software system that you're trying to build. And um, I think we've all been part of a, uh, of a software project in which you build this amazing technically engineering marvel and then you take the covers off and you go, ta-da, hope you like it. And your customer is basically like, oh, that's not at all what I expected. Uh, you did something completely different. And then you said, well, here are all our assumptions. Well, why did you make those assumptions? So false precision is a way of uh, incorrectly and sometimes harmfully excising ambiguity. But the best advice I can give to start this conversation off is just be comfortable with it, but seek to understand it uh, and to excise it over time. Well, let me be naughty here. Um, isn't that what Agile is all about? Isn't that what Agile is supposed to solve, where you go and formulate a vision North Star problem, and then you iterate your way into this using code artifacts and ideally getting users early involved in those kind of things? Isn't that a solved problem? That's, that's not naughty at all. That's exactly where we need to head in this conversation is don't be an attack sub. Don't collect a little bit of information and then go under the water and then sail around the world in service and be like, ta-da, hope it's, hope it's great. Continually set expectations. Excise ambiguity through dev sprints. Uh, excise ambiguity through spikes. Continue to focus on what the outcomes are and what the reasons you're building the software platform are. Those are the things I think that uh, are, are going to help you along this journey and then continually dropping in an agile cycle. Hey, this is what, here's the signal. This is what you're going to see. Hope you like what you saw. In the next sprint, this is what you'll see. Hope you like it then. Uli, I've known you long enough to know that your question indicates that you don't believe it's a solved problem. Why is this not a solved problem? Well, I think <clears throat> there are really two pieces to this. One is a person people thing, meaning if you are a person that loves certainty, going into a ambiguous situation, sometimes it's stressful, you really don't know how to deal with it. And I think that's something that you need to think about when you are an architect, you have to be comfortable with ambiguity. And if you can't, then you have to figure out how to learn how to do this and not try to answer the questions to Eric's point with too little information. Um, and I've seen people that are very good technical folks that are just really nervous when they don't understand all of aspects and they can't ask, answer all the questions that might be there. They feel like, whoa, I'm, I'm very unhappy. So there's a people aspect to this. 
And there is training for you to deal with ambiguity uh, that you should, uh, as an architect, you definitely need to live with, I have no idea what this is all about yet, but I will learn. Let me figure this out and let's, let's go step by step and learn more. I think that's one dimension. The second dimension is uh, agile is obviously a very, very solid way of dealing with this problem. Uh, the, the thing that the ad, ad, agile people also have realized is that without a clear North Star, um, you can't really go anywhere because it's just not feasible to direct a team without roughly knowing where, what you want to achieve or where you want to go. Uh, the agile guys, I think, call this enterprise agile. Um, I jokingly call it water scrum. doesn't really matter because you're, you're trying to figure out a way to think, how do I go and point somewhere? then iterate my, well, ideally to the point, and maybe you need to move the point because the vision that you um, excised wasn't quite uh, the right one, or the vision was the right one, um, but the implementation turns out to be completely wrong. There's a great example with Visual Studio Team, Fond uh, team Foundation Services or server at the time, so ages ago, um, they were, this, they had built a centralized um, software management system. And they were on the path of saying, now nah, I think given that we are growing in terms of the customer size we're serving, the developer teams, we need to become a distributed uh, development uh, organization in terms of uh, software management. And at the time, Git was not available when they made that decision. So they went down this path, did the planning, did all the work and started coding. And then Git showed up. So they kind of uh, looked at after a sprint, they looked at it and saying, hmm, we know that the North Star, we need a distributed source code management system is correct, but we think that coming out with a proprietary implementation is not going to win. So they switched direction and flipped over to uh, use Git. Um, so that's when they built the Git file system into Visual Studio team services. And I think that's another piece which Agile recognizes that, yes, the North Stars might still be right, but you need to effectively go and adjust. And I think those are some of these ambiguity scenarios that you as a person um, have to be comfortable with and as a team have to also be able to carry. Okay, I just want to ask a follow-up question and then move on to my the next thing that we're, I'm hoping we're talking about. Um, you said that there's training for dealing with uh, for amb ambiguous situations or amb amb ambiguity. Um, what's an example of that training, just so I know what you're talking about there? No, I mean, there's official training courses where you can start to learn, okay, how do you react um, and suppress your natural reaction of saying, oh, I need to know everything I need to, uh, that there is to know about a situation before I do anything. Um, so you get more comfortable with that. Again, I don't have a training course like go here, do that, read this book. Uh, but there are um, books, training courses available for you to say, go step back, learn how to, to let the situation develop before you go into full solution mode. Okay, cool. I just was hoping we could give them something to do a web search about. Um, maybe it's Well, actually, a lot of this, a lot of what Uli is talking about comes out of the uh, user experience discipline. And it's associated with making sure that you continually arrest your own uh, assumptions. And architects especially we typically are need to consume the specificity. And right. when there isn't one, we, it's almost like a back pressure that builds and we just spill our own uh, false precision out into the world. And it, when you're doing that, it makes, it makes your customer feel good. It makes you feel good. But in the end, you're going to kind of build this monster that nobody wants. Uh, I call it building the wrong thing in the right way. So the, the, one of the big ways to do this is just be aware of your biases and be aware of the information you don't have and then try to drive out the right individuals to unearth the right information for you. So um, confirmation bias, for example, is one in which you have the answer in mind and you're looking for people to back right. up your points of view. And if anybody doesn't back up your point of view, it's, ah, I don't wanna to talk to that person, but hey, you three, you think the same thing I think, let's go build this, this software platform. And that might be influencing, un, you know, un, inadvertently influencing customers to tell you what they want, but really you're kind of reverse telling them to tell you what you want. Uh, all of those dangers kind of abound if you don't kind of focus on some of these things that are found in the user experience discipline, which is what are your met and unmet needs? What are your unarticulated needs? What are some of the ways in which you 
wish you could solve this problem if you had unlimited time, money, and effort. Uh, and then following it, drilling down into specificity with like the money ball exercise and things like that. Okay, fi fi final question. How can you tell when you're in a false precision situation where you have made stuff up to fill in gaps? Like, how can you tell? Like, because you said boy. it's dangerous. How can you tell when? How can you tell when it's either happening or it's already happened? I mean, what, you might know all the way down the end when you're like, oh, I don't know what the heck this thing is I built. I, I was expecting a, an elephant, and you <clears> and, <throat> and it's not an elephant. But um, but how can you tell when it's happening? I don't think you can actually right off the bat. Oftentimes, because you you think you found the right answer and you're going ahead. So the way to go is ultimately you want validation you need to as people uh, always say run water through it uh, so you make an architecture assumption you drive some design and saying okay this is it great now you go back to your requirements ideally and say oh did we forget something and you ideally bring this design to a bunch of folks that look at it and saying nope you forgot that one this isn't quite right no nope, i didn't understand what you were doing here um, so that you get feedback before it goes too far. Um, so it's an, again, it's an iterative model cycle, whatever you want to call it, where you think through, through something, propose something, get feedback, keep iterating. And that's the key to drive, deal with this um, yeah, over ambitious model where you say, I know the answer, man. You don't need to, I, let's just go do this and um, everything will be great. Validation, external, internal, whatever you, you do is uh, the right way of doing it. And then obviously listening because the other piece is you know, the confirmation bias is also happening in product companies where people know, actually, if I go to this company, customer, they will absolutely buy anything I tell them. So I will have my validation because it's friendly, friendly folks. I generally go people go to people that don't like me or don't like the, the product that I generally represent and get their perspective because they will be far more brutal with you uh, than your friend for your friend saying, oh, this sounds great if I, I'll buy it. Um, but they're already buying for you anyway. So for them, it's natural. It's, it's more people that don't necessarily agree with you that you want to not necessarily convince, but you want to get a perspective from. Yeah. And by the way, I think, you know, 100 percent agree. Uh, but what we're not saying is be an order taker. Don't just listen to what people say and just be like, uh huh. And how and, you know, would you like fries with that? It's also having an opinion and challenging them enough to say, well, in the end, I'm, I don't want to give you faster horses. I want to give you an automobile. So this is the way in which we're going to approach it. Uh, but always 100 percent right. Also, sometimes if you're in a false precision fueled uh, software exercise, you might not know it until you go, ta-da, right? Uh, but the, there are some additional things that I'll add on to what Uli said, which is um, make sure that as a maturing organization, you focus on traceability so that every feature that you prioritize tracks back to an articulated requirement, which tracks back and collaborates with a product definition, which focuses on the North Star, and you have this uh, library of user experience stuff associated with it. Yeah. The second thing is, uh, and Uli's probably tired of hearing me ask this to people uh, in teams at Microsoft, I often ask, how do you know that? How do you know? Who did you talk to? Where is the data associated with that conclusion? Have you thought about that? Or is that what you believe and you want to be true? Um, so being able to ask the question is certainly a disarming way of challenging an assertion that could be a tenant of false precision. Okay, this is super helpful. Um, I'm going to go up and think about this. And so that means we have to stop this episode. So um, like therapy, huh? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Uli. Um, and thank you all for watching this episode of the Armchair Architects.